Hi, this is Tom from Life 4.0. This video is going to walk you through electrical charging and storage, at least how we do it on board our boat Sea Rose. This is very critical for a cruising sailboat. You're constantly having a need for electricity and you need to be thinking about what are going to be your charging sources and how do you use energy on board the boat efficiently. Uh, you can kind of think about it as if you were running a little electrical utility company because you're needing to balance supply in terms of charging sources and demand in terms of those things that are using electricity on your boat. How do you increase uh, your charging and supply as much as possible and how do you make your, your demand, uh, your consumption as efficient as possible so you're not wasting all that energy that you just spent time to generate. So I'm going to walk you through how we've set it up on C-Rose. This is actually media that I've been working on for several years and I'm excited to bring it to you as we've been refining how we've set this up. This is our uh, third boat that we've done this on and uh, we feel like we've got a really good system that works well. And So I'm going to walk you through the components of that and at a minimum I'd be happy if you get an appreciation for what systems are involved to keep a boat charged up and maybe even give you the incentive, the encouragement to do some work yourself. It's important to understand how electrical components work on a sailboat. Uh, it's in a harsh environment. We're exposed to salt water and just moisture in general, vibration, those kind of things. If you have an issue and you've been working on your charging system and your electrical wiring, you know a little bit about what's going on, you might have a better uh, chance of troubleshooting issues going forward when you're not around other places where people can help you. So I hope this gives you a little bit of incentive for that as well. So let's dive in. Hi, I'm Tom. And I'm Karen. Welcome to Life 4.0, where we share our adventures of life aboard our sailboat as we explore this amazing planet, one anchorage at a time. As a framework for our discussion, I will be referring to this diagram of our major electrical systems. It may seem a little daunting at first, but actually it's not that complicated. Starting along the top are the supply-related components, beginning with the engine alternator, followed by our solar array, and finally our battery charger that draws from shore power. In the center area are the storage components, starting with the engine starting battery, the much more substantial house battery bank, and finally the 24-volt bow thruster bank. At the bottom is the consumption side, including components such as the engine starter, the DC and AC house loads, and lastly, the bow thruster itself. In addition, there are the monitoring devices for keeping tabs on how much energy is generated and consumed. I will explain to you how all these components work and why they are important to have on a boat. Let's get started. Okay, so the first part of the charging system on the diagram is the alternator, the engine alternator. Uh, this is going to be something that you know pretty much every boat has as, as long as you have an inboard engine. Uh, you know, your, one of your main charging sources is going to be your engine alternator. On our boat, we've got a Yanmar engine. Up in this area, it has a 125 amp Valio alternator. Uh, that was a stock alternator on the engine. And that alternator um, then had, was set up to connect to what was here was an isolator, battery isolator. This is a fairly common thing that a lot of uh, manufacturers set up on uh, new boats and fairly recent boats. Uh, I'm not a big fan of isolators. There's a, if you read about them more, there's a voltage drop uh, that occurs from the isolator to the battery that is being charged. So I went with a upgrade kit that Balmar sells for the Valio. It's called a Smart Ready Retrofit Kit. Uh, the other alternative to this is to actually just get a Balmar alternator. They're very high quality alternators. They're made to put out a lot of high output. Uh, consistently and, and critically important is they're able to disseminate the heat that's generated when you're getting up to 100 or 150 amps of output, uh, especially when the batteries are quite low. So uh, Balmar made this retrofit kit for Valley alternator, so uh, that's what we're using now. It's worked well for us so far. Uh, that is then used with a Balmar regulator. That regulator is right here. This is an ARS-5 regulator. Um, they make a couple different types of regulators. We've used, I think, a 614 um, regulator in a previous boat. Very good quality. They're solid state. Um, all the electronics are, uh, circuits are inside 
um, underneath this epoxy, so very good quality. And uh, it's a do-it-yourself kind of item. You can follow the instructions and go through and understand how to wire these up. I'm not going to cover that today. I have a, another video where I walk you through the retrofit kit for the alternator and uh, the actual regulator itself, how to install that. So let's talk about voltage regulators in general. The uh, reason why you want an external voltage regulator is that they come with a three-stage charging algorithm. Uh, a lot of the regulators built into alternators, um, stock alternators, they're kind of like a car alternator. They're really not set up well to charge a deep cycle battery, something like a house battery bank that gets drained down low, and you want to efficiently charge it back up to full charge in as short a period of time as possible. So the three-stage algorithm has been uh, determined to be some of the best for the battery chemistry of a uh, deep cycle battery. It has a bulk stage, an absorption stage, and a float stage. And those are all different uh, voltage levels, and you can modify those if you want. Um, and there's a slightly different change if you're looking at a lithium battery bank. Lithium batteries uh, is a whole other topic in general, uh, but you can use these regulators to efficiently charge flooded lead acid batteries, AGM batteries, gel batteries, and lithium. Uh, so uh, they're great for that. This three-stage algorithm is really ideal for getting the most amps into your battery bank and charged up as quick as possible. So that's why you want a voltage regulator. That's one of the key things. If you don't already have one, look at either installing it yourself or getting a marine electrician to do it for you. Okay, so next up on that diagram is what's called a uh, digital dual charger. That's this device here. It looks very similar. It's kind of a similar footprint as Balmar's regulator but Balmar makes this digital dual charger. Uh, this is the second boat that we've had installed with it. Um, again, it's a do-it-yourself item, very well manufactured. All the circuitry is behind an epoxy uh, sealed enclosure there. And what this does is it takes voltage, uh, charging voltage coming in from the alternator, and it bleeds off um, a, a, about up to about 20 amps as needed to charge a secondary battery bank. Um, so this gets into how we kind of where we direct the charging current. Um, the charging current that comes in and is managed by the voltage regulator from the alternator, we send in to the house battery bank. And this is kind of a fundamental concept that I've gone with uh, after testing a couple different approaches. All of our battery charging uh, sources, the engine alternator, solar, and shore power, those are our three ones right now, they all go in to the house battery bank. And then I take amperage off of that to charge the engine starting battery with a digital dual charger. And I'll get into a little bit more in a minute, but I, we also take amps off of that to charge our bow thruster bank. Uh, so that digital dual charger is a great device. It is different than an isolator. Digital dual charger is looking at the charge on that secondary battery bank, in this case the engine starting bank, and it's taking amps off of the house bank in this case. It's sending up to 20 amps as needed to recharge that engine uh, starting battery. Now the typical scenario is you're going out to sail, you may be leaving the dock or the anchorage, running your engine for a little bit and then getting on with sailing and turning your engine off. You start your engine, you take a little bit of battery energy from your starting battery, and uh, that needs to be replenished. But it's not a lot. You've, char you've started the battery up and away you go. So you don't need a lot. Now, a lot of engines are set up as the output of the alternator goes to the engine starting battery first, and then they leave you to figure out what you want to do with the house bank. Uh, usually through an isolator or something like that. I've done the reverse of that. The house bank is where your, most of your drain is going to go on. Uh, you're running, for us, we're running refrigerators, you're running electronics, you're powering laptops and all that kind of stuff. That is getting drained down a lot during the day. Uh, so that's where I want the charging to go in initially and then to pull off of that the little bit that's needed to bring that engine starting battery back up to 100%. And I should mention um, a little bit more on the digital dual charger. The way that works is it's not always charging your engine starting bank. It only charges your engine starting bank if it's seeing a charging level voltage coming into the house bank. So it's not going to drain your house bank in order to charge the engine bank. It's going to wait and say, is there something coming into the house bank bringing voltage up to usually like 13 and a half volts? You can configure it the way you want it. Uh, but it's looking for that trigger to say, ah, something's coming in. There's shore power, solar, some other source. 
is charging the house bank and it's like, okay, I'm getting amps coming into the house bank. I'm going to steal some away to uh, bring the engine starting bank up to full charge. And then once it gets up to full charge, or if the house bank were to lose that charging source, the digital dual charger will shut down. Uh, the last little device here before we move on is this um, alternator protection device. Uh, this is something I just added in the last year. Uh, it's made by Sterling. Um, it is um, a protection in case, for whatever reason, the charge that's coming off the alternator were to get interrupted, uh, a wire were to come loose, uh, something where you know all those up to 125 amps coming in to this system were to be interrupted, you can damage the alternator, you can fry the diodes in the alternator. This is a device um, that sort of um, sucks away that surge and uh, kind of eases the drop in demand for the alternator. Um, very simple device to install. Um, now I've been talking about the engine starting battery. Uh, in our setup here, it's located right here. Um, it's one single battery. It's typically how things would go for an engine starting battery. Uh, it's a 12 volt battery. So um, you can see if you look down here, this is where the battery bank switches are and every boat's going to have this for safety reasons. Um, you've got a, a negative uh, on off switch to, to shut off the negative side of the boat. And then you've got two positive um, switches. This is typical, not exactly all boats are like this way, um, but you've got an on-off for the engine bank and an on-off for the house bank. So the way that looks behind here is, um, again, this is the engine side and this is the house side. If I get in here real close, you'll see there's sort of two sets of posts here. Um, this one is the battery side. You can see a heavy cable coming out of there and that heavy cable goes to the engine starting battery. This little wire here is the feed-in from the digital dual charger. So it's that um, up to 20 amps supply coming in from the house bank to charge up the engine starting battery. And so I've chosen to put them on the same post, um, I'm at the same side of the switch. So if the engine st um, starting battery switch is turned off, you're still going to get charged from the digital dual charger into the engine starting bank. Um, on the other side of the post is typically all the loads that are wanting to pull power from the engine starting battery. So you're going to get a heavy cable there um, down in here. <laughs> and if you were to follow this and you would do this on your, on your boat as well, it's going to go to the starter. So heavy cable, a lot of current needed to go to the engine starter to start the engine. Um, and then there's a couple more wires off here for monitoring voltage and that kind of thing. That's the uh, engine side. Okay, so let's move on to solar. As you can see in the diagram, we've got a pretty large solar array with over 900 watts, uh, made up of eight panels. And, uh, you know, this is really, uh, if we're not running the engine, this is our primary source for charging the batteries and keeping everything running on board our boat. And I've got a separate series, by the way, on solar and how we've set it up, so I won't go into great depth there, but each solar panel we set up with a solar charge controller. These are Victron uh, 7515, takes up to 75 volts and 15 amps. One setup for each panel in order to reduce the effect of shading. These take in the output from the solar panel at whatever voltage it is at, and then they um, provide a charging current it comes into a thermal breaker here for solar and then I can, you know, if there's an emergency I can shut that off uh, but we generally leave that on for the season. In the back of that you can see eight wires coming in on one side and on the other side of the breaker is the output of that uh, solar uh, from the breaker and it comes over to the house battery bank switch. So this is the back of the switch that was similar to the switch for that engine starting battery. So you can see a big cable down below here. That's coming in from the house battery bank. We have six AGM batteries. Um, and so charge current is coming in here. This, is, this wire is taking electricity off of the house bank and going to the digital dual charger. 
Um, and then again, on the other side of that battery switch is all the loads. Uh, this is going to the DC panel for all the DC breakers in the boat for lights and pumps and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's another uh, heavy wire there that's going into the inverter. Um, so all of the demands for the boat are coming out on this load side. Now, if you just think about this for a second, how loads are on this side, the batteries on this side, and the charging sources, I want to talk to you about that for a sec. So there's some discussion around uh, how to set up battery switches. And um, so there's a purist thought that on the one side of that switch is just the battery cabling. So the battery comes into that one switch, and everything else, all the loads, everything else is on the other side of that switch. And that is good because if you turn that switch off, you're completely isolating that battery bank. There's nothing going to come out of that battery bank and go to any of those uh, consumption or load sources. Um, but what I found, I did this initially and, I, and it was a mistake, uh, was I brought the solar output into that load side as well, thinking, okay, I want to make sure I can isolate the battery off. If I want to shut the house bank battery off for an emergency or fire or whatever, I just rotate that switch. Yes, the house bank is turned off, but you're still supplying electricity from solar into everything on the load side. And I was like, well, I, I thought I'd turn the uh, house bank battery switch off, but I'm still getting power to lights and all that kind of stuff. So I've decided to put all of the charging sources, solar, uh, alternator, uh, shore power, on the battery side as well. So there's a little bit of a risk there when we turn the battery switch off. If we have any one of those other sources on, solar, shore power, or alternator, then you, you haven't really kind of completely isolated the battery, but it's a compromise. And the way we work around that is we have a, a thermal breaker for the solar, so I can shut that off. Of course, the shore power I can go, and I can either turn that off, unplug it, or whatever, and the engine alternator, if the engine not, uh, engine's not running, alternator's not going to be producing any power. So you kind of have a little compromise there. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, we have a shore power charger. Uh, we're not plugged into shore very much at all. Um, a lot of other boats are. We have um, a little 10 amp charger and then I also have a 40 amp charger. So it comes in to the house bank as well. It's wired right in down on one of these red cables coming in to the battery side of the house bank switch. So, and a, a point of reference here, so I've been talking a lot about the positive wires coming into the house bank and engine bank switches. Uh, the positive output from the alternator and all that. The negative side uh, is generally all going to one negative bus and uh, hopefully your boat's set up with this, uh, some kind of negative bus. We have one over on this side so this is all the negatives or grounds on the boat and you've got a lot of lugs there to be able to add more connections to. Um, and then there is the uh, negative battery switch here um, so that shuts off um, the negative side of um, both the house and the starter, the, the base of the whole 12 volt system. Okay, so that um, covers quite a few things. I wanted to go on next to uh, the inverter. And that again is pulling from the house battery side. Uh, it's one of these heavy cables down here. It's going to have a heavy cable because we have a 2000 watt inverter. Um, so it's pulling off the house bank and providing 110 volt electricity to outlets on the boat. Again, all of that is pulling in from the house bank. And next I'll go into our bow thruster bank. So we've got three battery banks on the boat. I've talked about the engine starting battery, the house uh, bank with six batteries. We've also got a two battery bow thruster bank. 24 volt bow thruster, so it's using two 12 volt batteries to provide that. Both of those batteries are up in the bow close to the bow thruster, uh, but the charging mechanism is back here. All right, so the way that that works is we have another uh, Victron device for that. You can see it down here, the Orion Tri-Smart 1224-10. 10 is referring to the amps. Um, so this is a DC to DC charger. Sometimes they're also called a converter uh, because it's designed to take an input as you can see there, uh, input of 12 volts, well, anywhere from 8 to 17, and to output uh, pretty close to 24 volts, 20 to 30 volts. You set up what your um, you know, base output is. And it's got a power rating of 10 amps. So this um, DC-DC charger, again, 
pulling off of that house battery bank. Um, it's only going to pull off power, kind of like the digital dual charger, only going to pull off power when uh, there is a charge current on the house bank. So it's looking for around 13.4, 13.5 volts, and when it sees that, it kicks into gear and um, converts that 12 volts to 24, really actually it's more like 26 volts uh, to be a charging current for the bow thruster bank. So the uh, two wires coming in from the house bank, two wires going out um, at the 24 volt level to go up forward to the two batteries up there. I love it, it works great. I used to have a, another converter in here. Uh, the, well, for one thing it had a fan and the fan was always running and consuming electricity and it wasn't nearly as efficient um, and I couldn't uh, program it and configure it. So this works a lot better for that. Okay, that wraps up part one of this two-part series on battery charging and energy management. In part two of the series, we'll walk through the important energy monitoring devices that will help you keep tabs on how much power is generated and how much is consumed. I'll walk you through the devices we've installed on board C-Rose and have used for several seasons now. I will also explain the installation and wiring of these monitoring tools. Until then, we thank you for your continued support and we look forward to your comments. Finally, if you are interested in solar power at your home or business, be sure to check out my seven-part series on designing and building a land-based 10-kilowatt solar array. Fair winds. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe to our channel and click on the bell to get notified of new videos.